continue in the book of Isaiah this morning. We'll be in Isaiah chapter 33. Isaiah chapter 33, the song that you heard this morning was written many years ago by a preacher who wanted to write a song about the gospel story, and it's been put in several settings along with the original one that was back in the day, and he wrote it, and that's a newer setting of it one day. It's good to see you this morning. I hope you have enjoyed this weekend. I'll tell you, yesterday you had a real bona fide pig roast. Let me tell you, it was just as authentic as it could ever be, and uh, it was a great a great time of fellowship. I enjoyed the food. It was a real pleasant surprise uh, to be able to see the beans. I had no idea that I would get to see them. I knew they had moved to North Carolina. Isn't it a shame? We both live in North Carolina, but the only way I can see them is to come to New Jersey, right? So it just shows you um, how busy we all are, but it was so great to see them. And I will tell you, there's one thing that almost impressed me as much as the pig yesterday. And that was the desserts. Amen. Pastor, I hear you preach about desserts and your, your people, your people follow your lead. I will tell you what, uh, you know, I, I just enjoyed the day. There were so many things that excited me about yesterday. One is uh, getting to see some familiar faces, of course, seeing the Browns and uh, being familiar with their ministry for years. Uh, seeing some of our graduates, uh, it's good to see the Johns uh, serving here. And uh, some of you we recognize from previous years that we've been here. And to see uh, that the people in this church actually have friends. Amen. You know, that is great. And uh, I thought it was... And you know what? That same spirit of uh, building friendship and reaching out to friends, that ought to prevail the entire year. And I hope uh, you can't have a pig roast every weekend because that gets expensive and time consuming. Uh, but you know what? Sometimes it's just a little token. Sometimes it's a timely word uh, that you give to a neighbor in the time of need or a friend. And so I hope that you'll maintain that spirit uh, throughout the remainder of this year. But we're glad to be a part of the meeting today and uh, this week. And uh, look forward to sharing with you a little bit about family updates, ministry updates at the college. We have some great things that are happening there. But this morning, I want to take you to the Old Testament. We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 33 this morning, and I want to preach to you a message that I've entitled, Who is God? So with the time that we have this morning, let's look at Isaiah 33, verse number 22. Isaiah chapter 33 and verse 22, the Bible says, For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Amen. Several years ago, I was preaching down in Pensacola, Florida. It was actually with Pastor's son in law who was pastoring there years ago. And while I was preaching in Pensacola, I had a couple of our graduates. A married couple, they were living out in Mobile, Alabama, which was about an hour away. And they called me and they said, hey, we hear that you're preaching in Pensacola. We'd like to come one night, go out after the service. I said, that'd be great. And so it was, I think, on a Monday or Tuesday night, Bubba and Sarah came from Mobile, Alabama. You say, Bubba, that is a good southern name. It is. His given name was Francis but his friends called him Bubba, and I can understand. You now, if your name is Francis, listen, no offense, but just when you're in Alabama where he was raised, Bubba is probably the better term. And so they came over. I'll never forget after the service, we went to a restaurant there in the area. It's a very high-end, uh, eloquent restaurant. You say, what was it? It's called Arby's. Have you ever been to one of those? <laughs> I will tell you this, though. When you eat fast food anymore, it's high in on the prices, isn't it? It's amazing how that's gone. So no sooner than we sat down, we started talking and just catching up. He was talking about his ministry. I was talking about what God was doing in my life. And we had probably not been in that conversation more than five minutes. And I mean a total stranger that we had never met before pulled up a chair, sat it at our table with the three of us, and he looked at us and he said, can I ask you a question? I thought, well, sure. And I will never forget his question. This young man in his early 20s looked at us and he asked the question, who is God? 
And for a moment, I was speechless. Now, I know some of you say, it's hard to imagine a preacher speechless. I know. And there may be some of you who are a little judgmental, and you'd say, well, I don't know why you're speechless. You're a preacher. And uh, if anybody ought to be able to answer that question, it ought to be a preacher. And I would say to you, yes, you're right, but here's my problem. When somebody asks you the question, who is God? And God has always been. He's the Alpha and the Omega. My problem is, where do you start? And so after I regained my composure, we went from Genesis to Revelation in a span of about 30 minutes and we tried to introduce him to the God of the Bible. It's interesting, I learned after the fact that here was a man in his early 20s and in recent weeks he had been searching and asking different groups of different denominations of different worldviews. He had talked to Buddhists, he had talked to Hindus. He had talked to spiritists and he viewed us as mainstream Christianity and so that's why he wanted to ask us that question. But can I tell you something, ladies and gentlemen? I believe the question that was asked by that one man that night is still being asked by many in America today. There are many people who know who God is as a general concept When you mention the word God today, that can mean so much to so many different people. But today when I ask the question, who is God, I want to be very specific. Did you notice in our verse that we just read that the word Lord is in all caps? Did you know that's not by accident, that's not a typographical error? That is a designation to the reader to show him that is the name Jehovah. And so when I'm talking about who is God, I'm being very specific. I'm not talking about the man upstairs that some people may refer to God as. I'm not talking about a general spirit that just flows through the air as many people would say today, but I'm speaking about the specific God, the Lord Jehovah. And so if somebody came to you and they asked you the question, who is God, what would you say? Well, with the help of Isaiah this morning, I'd like to answer that question. And I want you to see God for who He really is. And you know what I believe? I believe that if you'll see God for who He really is and you understand His desire for you, listen to me ladies and gentlemen, that will cause you to run to Him. Because there is none greater, there is none mightier, there is none more loving, there is none that is greater than God Almighty. And I want to describe Him to you this morning. Now to answer the question, who is God, I want to simply resort to the text. Number one, the Lord is our judge. Now I know that that's not the most popular description of God, but it is a necessity. Here's something that's true about the entire human race. Listen, this year I've been to India. This year I've been in places all over this country and do you know that whether it's a foreign country or another state, here's something I realize, human nature is the same. And there's something true of everybody in the human race and it's this, is that we by nature hate accountability, don't we? How many times have you heard the, heard the story of the teenage young man who says, I'm tired of mom and dad telling me what to do. I can't wait to move out of the house and be my own man. I'm going to join the army. And every time I hear that story, I shake my head and I say, you're about to jump from the frying pan into the fire. Because the drill sergeant's not your mother and it's going to be a long, long four years. But why does a young man utter those foolish words? Well, it's very obvious because none of us like accountability in and of ourselves. As kids, we hated being accountable to our parents. Some of you hate being accountable to the state troopers that are on the highway. There's just something inside of all of us that pushes against and resents the idea of accountability. But here's something I want you to hear me very plainly and very well. 
Every person in this room is accountable to God. Whether you recognize it or not. That's a fundamental truth. The God who created every last person under the sound of my voice today is the God that you and I are accountable to. And therefore, God is the judge. Now, there are a lot of people today, and they say, well, I'm not accountable to God. Do you know that whether or not a person realizes he accountable, he's accountable to God does not erase the fact that he's accountable to God? That's like a child who walks around and says, you know what, I'm not going to listen to my parents. They're not my parents. He can declare that all day long, but it doesn't change the fact that they're his parents. Well, as a member of the human race, you can deny the existence of God. You can say that He doesn't exist, but it does not erase the fact that you're accountable to God. And I want to talk to you about that judge for just a moment. It's important for you and I to realize that this judge is a righteous judge, or if I could say it, He is a perfect judge. You know, there's some of you after the service today, you're going to watch a football game. And you know what you're going to find in that football game? That the referees are imperfect. And you know what's amazing is even with instant replay, they still can miss a call. There are some of you today, you, maybe you like sports right now. You're, you're watching, maybe it's your baseball team, your football team. You see a referee or you see an umpire and you say, how in the world could they blow that call? Well, I'll tell you why, because they're human beings. But did you know that the Bible tells us in the book of Genesis, chapter 18 and verse 25, it says, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So make no bones about it. God Almighty is a perfect, righteous judge. He never makes a bad call. And every one of us, we're going to stand one day before the judge. Did you know that? There's not a lot of things that I can tell you for sure. I can't even tell you if it's going to rain before the day is out. But one thing that I can tell you, I believe based on the Bible, is that every person in this room, and this one on the platform included, one day we will stand before God. And I believe for all of us, It's true that we're going to stand before God in one of two places. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 20 verses 11 through 15 that there is a great white throne judgment. It's a judgment that's described at the end of the Bible and it's a time in which every unsaved individual, and when I'm talking about unsaved, I'm not talking about non-churched or I'm not talking about just people who totally hate God, I'm talking about those who have never accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. The Bible says that one day they're going to stand before the judge and this is a fierce judgment. Let me tell you why. Because here is lost mankind standing before God and the heavens and the earth flee away. Do you remember as a kid when you were in the house and your parents were upset? That wasn't the time for them to be entreated. As a matter of fact, usually children make an exodus at that point. Just let them be to themselves. There's coming a day where the wrath of God will be so great that the heavens and the earth will will pass away and it will be God the judge and lost mankind and there's only one sentence to be weighed at that judgment. The Bible tells us that God is going to look into the book of life And whoever's name is not found in that book of life, they are cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Now that's a very difficult judgment to speak of. God is going to look in this book. If their name's not in the book, then they're cast into the lake of fire. Now there are some people that take objection and they say, well preacher, I'm just going to tell you that one of the problems I have with the God that you speak of is that very scene that you've described. 
You talk about how God is so loving and how God is so kind, and yet we find at this moment that God is casting these people into the lake of fire. Listen, if that registers in your mind, can I tell you your understanding of God is incomplete? Because the people who make that argument, they say, I don't understand why God would cast people in hell. They're the same ones who have refused to acknowledge that God gave His only Son, Jesus Christ, to die in the cross, on the cross for your place and mine to keep us from going there. So don't you stumble over that inconvenient fact. Every person that one day steps into hell is going to have to step over the grace of God because God gave His Son Jesus to die for you and to die for me. But it doesn't erase the fact that one day there's going to be a judgment and every person that's rejected Jesus Christ will stand before the great white throne. Several years ago, I was in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. I was preaching in a church and on my way up, the pastor told me the name of the hotel where I was staying. And I remember uh, thinking to myself, okay, and you know, sometimes instead of writing it down, you just remember it. And our memories are sometimes faulty. I pulled into Elizabeth City. I came to the hotel. I stood at the door and I walked in and I saw the receptionist and I said, hi, my name's so-and-so. I think I have a room here at the hotel. And after about a minute of looking, she looked at me and she said, no. I said, that's okay. It must be under the pastor's name. And I gave the pastor's name. And after a minute of looking, she said, no. I said, well, maybe it's under the church's name. (laughs) And so I gave her the church's name. And after a minute of looking, she said, no. If I'd have known the secretary's name, I would have given her name, but I didn't know it. (laughs) And so I just stepped away, and I'll be honest, I was a little bit frustrated. And I called the pastor, and I said, Pastor, I'm here at the hotel, and they say there's not a room. And he said, where are you at? I told him. He said, that's not the hotel that I told you. (laughs) He said, it's this place. I said, oh, okay, Pastor. And I went back up to that woman very sheepishly, and I apologized for, for being an oaf for about five minutes of her time. But you know, it's embarrassing when you go to a hotel, you think you're at the right place and they don't have the reservation. I still remember the embarrassment I felt. I still remember the frustration that I felt. But let me tell you something, that pales in comparison when you end your life and you stand at the threshold of eternity and you're looking at heaven and hell and your name is not in the book of life. But let me tell you, instead of your heart being filled with frustration your heart's going to be filled with agony and regret. My friend, if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus Christ, I want to tell you one day you're going to stand before the judge and if your name's not in the book of life, you'll be cast in the lake of fire. But Christian, I want to remind you just very quickly, did you know that every Christian in this room is one day going to stand before God? The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 10, for we shall all appear, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Every last one of us. And the Bible tells us that we're going to give an account for the things that we've done in our body, whether it be good or bad, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. Do you know what that tells me, Christian? If I'm wasting time on this earth, I'm going to lose reward in eternity. It's that simple. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 tells us that everything the Christian does is going to be lumped into one of two categories. Wood, hay, and stubble, gold, silver, and precious stone. It'll be refined by fire. Here's the bottom line, Christian. You live your life for yourself and you give God a back seat and you serve yourself and you don't serve the Lord. Let me tell you, that's wood, hay, and stubble. But you know, when you sacrifice, when you give of your time and talents for the Lord and you do it for the right motive, you know what that is? That's gold, silver, and precious stone. And God even recognizes the seemingly most insignificant things done by people in this church. 
I'm convinced God sees every straightened hymnal. Every piece of trash that's thrown away. Every dessert that's baked or brought. Can I tell you, God sees what we're doing. Now, Christian, I want to make something very clear. I don't think of the judgment seat of Christ our sin is judged because I think my sin was judged on Calvary. But I'm going to tell you something. Our works will be judged. And I'm talking to some of us here today. Listen, you say, I'm saved, and you raise your hand. You say, you know what? I know the Lord is my Savior, but yet you know you're not living for God. Listen to me. You better see Him as the judge and start laying up gold, silver, and precious stones. You ever stood before a judge before? I'll tell you, there was one time I stood before a judge. I was 17 years old. When I got my driver's license, my mom gave me this speech, and it's a speech that all parents have given to their children after they get their driver's license. And here's basically the cliff notes of that speech. Mom basically said, if you get a ticket, I'm going to kill you. At the age of 17, I got a ticket. Now, I know I'm still living, but it's a miracle. But I still remember going to the courthouse in the Forsyth County courthouse and seeing for the first time a judge. I remember walking into that room, and when I saw that man wearing a black robe with power that I did not have, Can I tell you, it brought me to my knees almost, if not physically. In my heart, I was melting. Whenever that man asked me a question, it wasn't, yep, uh uh-huh, uh-uh. No, it was like, yes, sir. (laughs) I'm going to tell you, there was something, it it was such an intimidating experience And it's something that I never want to repeat. But listen to me. In eternity, every one of us is going to stand before the judge and we better start living like it. And my friend, if you've never trusted Christ, God offers you the opportunity to miss that judgment. But not only is God the judge, the second thing that I want you to see is that God is the lawgiver. Where do we get a sense of what is right and what is wrong? Do you think two cavemen were sitting around a primitive fire a billion years ago with bucked teeth and slanted foreheads and furry eyebrows and in guttural language one looked at the other and said, hmm Kill people bad. Let me tell you something. Man left to himself is going to kill and destroy. Man didn't come up with what was right and what was wrong. You know who who did? God. Now, I know that's not a popular worldview today, but I'm going to tell you, just like when the waters came down in Noah's day and the flood came, I'm going to tell you there's going to come a day where this nation and this world will wake up and realize that there's somebody that's bigger than it that made the rules. And everybody back in the floods day would have said, I wish to God I would have listened to Noah. I would hate that there'd be people in this room that would say, I wish to God that I would have listened to Pastor Brown or that I would have listened to the preacher as he preached the Bible. Listen, now is your moment to understand God is the lawgiver. My mom lived with us for about six years before she passed away. I was an only child and so... When her health started to decline, we kept her. And You know, there's a reason God did not give 70-year-olds young children. Ladies, there's a reason that birthing process stops after a certain age. Uh, my mom, those children were running through the house doing what children do, and I was watching my mom, and I could just see it just rising in her. 
And finally, she came to the point where she'd had enough. And my mom stood up and she slapped her hand down on the table. And she said, that's it. I'm laying down the law. <laughs> and she did. Can I tell you a long time before U.S. Congress ever met that somebody laid down the law? And that person is God. Thou shalt not kill or murder. You know why in our system today you just can't go out and shoot someone indiscriminately without going to jail or maybe even losing your life? Because it was declared wrong, but a long time before that was ever made a statutory law, God said it in the Ten Commandments. Why is it wrong to steal? Is it just because if you get caught it's a bad thing? No, it's wrong to steal because God said it was wrong. Why is it wrong to lie? Thou shalt not bear false witness. Folks, we've not gone very far in the Bible and we see that just in those three things alone, God stated them in the Ten Commandments. But you know what? We live in a world today that refuses to acknowledge that God is the lawgiver. And can I tell you, not only do they doubt God's moral law, but they, got, they doubt God's natural law. Even the laws of nature that have been set in motion since humanity began. The world has gone stark raving mad to deny it. And there are so many people today that are caught up in it. There may be some of you. And you say, well, I think that sounds right. There comes a point where you have to see what God says and you have to see what man does and you have to realize that God is the lawgiver. We're all accountable to Him. There are people today, you speak your truth and I'll speak mine. I think that's a bunch of rubbish. I say the sky is blue. You say it's like cotton candy. It's pink. And I say you're wrong. And you can look at it and they say, well, that's your truth. That's my truth. Listen, there is the truth and that's God's truth. But God is the lawgiver. There are some people and they say, well, I don't think that anybody should have that right. And these are the same people that will watch a basketball game that has boundaries, three-point lines, and referees. What happens if you play a basketball game and somebody says, you know what, let's wipe out the out-of-bounds lines. There's no out-of-bounds and let's make baskets whatever you feel like. If you feel like that's a two-pointer, that's fine. If you feel like it's a three-pointer, that's fine. In football, let's just make touchdowns all anywhere from 10 to 14 points apiece. You know what, after a while, every one of those sports loses their, their, their glow and all of a sudden attendance plummets. And people say, those aren't games, that's just chaos. Let me tell you, the same thing is happening in the world today. It's not happening with a basketball game, but it's happening with the human race. Why? Because they're erasing the boundaries. God is the lawgiver. And I've got some bad news for you. All of us have broken God's law. Years ago, I was preaching in a children's church in Matthews, North Carolina. I was teaching a group of kids. There were probably 50 or 60 in there. And I said, how many of you are sinners? And everybody raised their hand but one boy. I'll never forget it. I asked that question. He leaned back in his chair. He folded his arms. And very deliberately he went. I'd hate to think there's an individual in this room that's done the same thing. Every one of us, we've fallen short of God's law. 
You know why some people don't want to be saved? Because they don't think they need to be saved. I'm going to tell you, every one of us need to be saved. You know why? Because every one of us has broken God's law. I've talked to some people. They get a little righteous. They say, I'm not that bad a person. You ever lie to your parents? Well, a little bit. Well, you've broken one of the commandments. Actually, you've broken two. Have you ever seen yourself as just being in need of God? The song that we sang this morning emphasized, Come ye sinners, the fact that we need to feel, we need to see our need for Him. Number one, God is the judge. Number two, God is the lawgiver. Number three, I want you to see that God is the king. The Lord is our king. He is in that place of superiority. If I could say it this way, God is over all. God is more powerful than the government. God is more powerful than all of the governments combined. And the book of Revelation teaches us that. You say there's a lot of madness going on in this world. I'm going to tell you why there's a lot of madness going on in this world right now. It's because of the sinfulness of man. You want to know why there's killing? You want to know why there's lying? You want to know why there's chaos and they're backbiting? Because you're seeing man at his very worst. That's why. But can I tell you there's somebody who rises above all of that. There's somebody who cannot be conquered by the conniving of man. There's somebody who cannot be overcome by the wisdom of man. Who is that? That is God. Why? Because God is the king. He is in the place of superiority. Every night when you go outside, you see a fireworks show that God puts on for you. Why? The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth His handiwork. God knows every star by name. Why? Because He is the King. He is over all. And yet here we are on a sin-cursed earth. And you know what man wants to do? Wants to take God off the throne. Right now in this state, there are many people that would just not even care about God. They don't even acknowledge His superiority. And yet God, who is the King, has all of these subjects that want to take Him off the throne and want to deny His existence. But that leads me to my last point. I want you to see last of all, and I think best of all, not only is the Lord our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, but last of all, I want you to see that the Lord is our Savior. He will save us. You know, people, they say, well, God is like, and, you know, they'll talk about something in the world, you know. They would say, God is like Coke. He's the real thing. I know what they're trying to do, but I've never subscribed to that. And I'm going to tell you why. Because there's really nobody like God. And this is one of the reasons why. Can I confess to you, I'm blown away when I think that God is the judge. I say, why in the world would He want to be the Savior? Imagine with me, you're a judge and you have before you a criminal who is as guilty as can be. There's no, there's no argument. And let's say he is of the worst sort. And you are the judge. This person has violated the law. And now it comes to the judge to pronounce sentence. A human judge would be inclined to look and say, Are you guilty? Yes, you're guilty. I find you guilty. And here is your sentence. And off you go. But did you know what God chose to do? When you stood for him, in front of Him, so to speak, and you're as, as guilty as can be, you have broken God's law, and He has every right to pronounce judgment on you, God halts the proceeding and says, Wait a second. I know you're guilty. But wait just a second. And the judge has His only Son... 
come out the side door and he stands before his father and the judge says, listen, I know you're guilty, but I'm going to let my son stand in your place and take your punishment. Do you know of a human judge that would do that? Did you know that's exactly what God did for you when Jesus Christ came into this world and died on the cross? He died in your place. And you know what I'm telling you? I'm thankful not only that God is the judge, but that He's the Savior. God is the lawgiver. Let me ask you parents something. When your children repeatedly disobey you and break your law, does that endear you to them? You say, what do you mean? When your children repeatedly disobey you, does that make you want to hug them and say, I love you more than ever? Some of you are like, yeah, I grab them, but it's not around the waist. Let me tell you, God looks down in this place. Listen, we have all broken God's law. Let's just not make any pretense. Let's take our masks off for just a second. Here we have all broken God's law and instead of coming down upon us and stomping us, He says, I'm going to tell you what. And He takes His Son Jesus and He says, I know you're a lawbreaker and I'm going to take this one who is the perfect person. He has never sinned. He is God in the flesh and I'm going to give my only Son for you. I'm going to tell you, there's not a congressman that would do such a thing. My friend, I'm glad that God's not only the lawgiver, I'm glad He's the Savior. Amen. And you know what? The Lord is our King. The Lord could look down and say, you bunch of ingrates, you don't even think I exist. The truth is, every breath you take, it's borrowed from me. But you know what? Instead of God looking down with disgust and just draining us all off this globe, He gave His Son Jesus to die on the cross that a bunch of rebels could be made a child of God. And yet this God is rejected by so many. My friend, I want to ask you, is He your Savior? If there's never been a time in your life when you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have missed who God really is. So many people, and, there, and, and maybe there's some here guilty today. We t- oh, I, yeah, I know, I know about God. I know about God. You know, I'm a preacher. Whenever I talk to somebody, I'll say, fine. Oh, yeah, I know about God. Can I tell you, there's a big difference between knowing about God and knowing Him. After the Queen of England died, I was watching some newscasts and videos and I stumbled upon an interview that I've never forgotten. There was an interview, a British anchor was interviewing one of the Queen's uh, police detail. This was before her death. And she said, sir, do you have any interesting stories about the queen? And he chuckled and he said, actually, I do. He said, I was with the queen. We were over in Balmoral, which is over in Scotland. It was a palace where she would retreat to from time to time. And the police guard said, and there'd be times that the queen would just like to go out for a picnic and it would just be the queen and myself as I escorted her and we would go wandering out into the woods to the picnic area and she would have a picnic. We'd have a delightful conversation. He said after one of these conversations we were making our way back to the castle and we stumbled upon two Americans. And the two Americans saw us. They were on the path just walking around and of course you have to understand the Queen of England didn't always wear a crown on her head and a scepter in her hand. She looked very common and ordinary at that time. And the two Americans went up to them and said, Hey, how are you? And the Queen began to make conversation. Where are you from and what do you do for a living and such? And one of the Americans asked the Queen, said, Well, uh, ma'am, uh, where do you live? And she said, oh, I live back over in London. And they said, well, what are you doing here? 
And she said, oh, for many years my family has vacationed out here and we just have a place out here in the country. And we come out here for vacation. And they said, well, that's nice. And then they looked at her and they said, have you ever met the queen? <laughs> and she looked at them without missing a beat and said, no, I haven't. But my friend here has seen her, sees her all the time. The two Americans fastened their attention on the security guard and said, you've met the queen? And he said, yes, I have. They said, what is she like? He said, well, she's a pretty nice woman, but she can be ornery every once in a while. And as soon as he answered, the two Americans handed their cell phone to the Queen of England put their arms around the security guard and said, take our picture with him because he has met the queen. <laughs> and after taking the picture, the security guard, knowing the situation, said, you know, I think it might be, why don't you take a picture with this little old lady too, just as a keepsake. And they said, sure. And they went beside the queen and they did that, you know, and he handed them the phone. And as those two Americans were leaving, the Queen of England said to him, I would love to be a fly on the wall. When they get back to America and they find out who I really am, But I'm going to tell you, here's the sad thing. Probably every person in this room, you'd say, yeah, I know about God. But the truth is, is you don't know Him because you don't know His Son, Jesus Christ. You know, it's possible for you to leave this room and know about God and not know Him. But instead of it being a little embarrassment when you get back home, listen to me, it's going to be hellfire for all eternity. And God extends an invitation to you when He says, Look unto me, all ye ends of the earth, and be ye saved. What is keeping you from coming to God through Jesus Christ today? Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I just want to ask you these questions. Because I believe when the truth of God's Word is presented to you, you ought to, you ought to reflect upon it. And I wonder how many in this room today you'd say this. You'd say, Alton, there was a time in my life when I saw my need to be saved. I knew that I had fallen short of God's standard. And you'd say, Alton, there was a time in my life where I saw my need for God and I heard what Jesus Christ did on the cross for me. He died for my sins. He was raised on the third day. And you'd say, Alton, as you preach today, not only do I know about God, but you say, I know Him because there has been a time in my life where I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And today, my heart is full because I know, I know the Lord. I know that I'm saved because I have trusted Christ. And today, I can say with a confidence in my heart, I know that I'm a child of God. If you can say that, would you slip your hand up for just a moment? You'd say, I, I know that I know the Lord. I know Christ is my Savior. All right, thank you. You may put them down. For those of you who maybe think question like that puts us all on the spot, I'm well aware that it does. But the greatest day of my life was when God put me on the spot. And not only did He show me my problem, but He showed me the solution. And that day my life was changed when I placed my faith in Christ. And did you know that you can do the same thing? You may be here today and you're well-meaning. You try to be a good person, but you've never come to grips with the question, who is God and trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Listen, today, 
please understand, God is not only the judge and the lawgiver and the king, but God is the Savior. He wants to be your Savior. And I wonder if there'd be friends here today, whether you're uh, regular at this church or maybe this is your first time, whatever the case, I wonder if there'd be some today and you'd say, Alton, I have heard this message and today I see myself before the Lord. I realize that I have broken God's law. And you'd say, Alton, I know that I need to be saved. I see that God wants to be the Savior in my life. And you'd say, Alton, I'm here today. I've seen my need for the Lord. I've never trusted Christ as my Savior. And today, not only do I want to know about God, but I want to know Him. You'd say, Alton, today God is dealing in my heart about being saved. God has shown me some things that I've never realized before. And today would you pray for me because I, I, I know that there's a need in my heart. Only God can fill it. And today God has shown me my need to be saved. Would you please pray for me today? If that's you, would you slip your hand up just long enough for me to see it? You can just slip it right up and right back down. And then one last question I would ask to every Christian here. Wood, hay, and stubble, gold, silver, and precious stone. It's time to be serving the Lord. The time is short and eternity's coming. If you're able, would you join me in standing? Let's stand together. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Would you join me in standing? Our Father, as we come to this portion of the service, I pray that the truth of the Word of God would set its plow in our hearts very deeply. Lord, I pray for those here this morning that are wrestling with the truth. Lord, may they not be so overcome by judgment and law that they miss the Savior. Sometimes the devil is such a distractor. God, I pray that we all leave this place. That not only would it be very clear that, Lord, you want to be the Savior, but that we would humble our hearts. And that everyone in this room would yield to the truth. That's our prayer. Lord, thank you that we can know you. And I pray that in these closing moments that you would continue your work in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Our pianist just begins to play softly the song of invitation. If you're here today and you've never trusted Christ, then you say, Alton, there were some things that resonated in that message. Well, this is your opportunity. You can come in a service like this. I've extended so many invitations through the years. and giving people an opportunity to respond to the truth of God's Word at the end of a service just like this. And if you're here today and you'd say, Alton, I'm not saved. God's dealing in my heart. I need help. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. I would just invite you to step out right where you're at. Myself and Pastor will meet you at the front. We'll have somebody take you aside and take the Bible and show you how you can be saved. Come just as you are. For others that are here today, you say, oh, I don't know that I could come. I'll tell you, if you talk to us after a service, talk to a friend, talk to a familiar face and say, God's doing something in my heart. Can you help me? Well, I'll assure you that God can and God will. The Bible says that if you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, He'll lift you up. You come to Him and in no wise will He cast you out. I'm just going to have her play one last verse and then we'll be done. Just as I am without one plea. Has there been a time in your life where you've come to the Lord? I hope so. For me, it was at the age of 12. Maybe this week I'll have the opportunity to share my testimony with you. How that God took me out of a home that was filled with strife and managed to give me peace. Took me out of a situation that didn't seem to have much hope and He gave me hope. And I'll assure you, God can do the same with you.
right, you can look this way. Pastor's going to come and close the service here in just a second. Thank you for being here uh, this morning. I hope you'll come back tonight. Uh, tonight at 7 o'clock, is that right, Pastor? I need to make sure I'm here at 7 o'clock. I've learned that I have to ask for times, you know. And uh, so be back tonight at 7 o'clock and then every night this week. And can I tell you, I, I was raised in the rural part of North Carolina. I'm just going to say what some of you probably say behind my back. I'm a country bumpkin. That's what I am. <laughs> but can I tell you, it is worth fighting city traffic and city problems to come to church to hear God's voice. It's worth it. As a matter of fact, this needs to be the loudest voice you hear right here. You need to hear it more than any politician, any celebrity, any athlete. And when we gather back every night this week, that's I'm hoping that we will hear God's voice. If I can help you, I'd love to do so after the service, and I hope to see you back tonight. Pastor, if you'd close. Brother, it's at Kendall Park Baptist Church is where we'll be meeting tonight here. Just want to remind you here, so it's not some other church up or down the road here. Anyway, hey, that was a great message this morning, wasn't it? Praise the Lord. Very, very straightforward, very simple. It's something you can remember. You remember the four points? Amen. You got them all down? God is my second, third, you're getting weaker, and fourth, the greatest of all. He is our Savior. Never forget that. That is our God. So grateful to have you out today. Very thankful for a great challenge here this morning. I hope you will be back tonight. Uh, there's more of that coming, and uh, you don't want to miss out on the blessing. So please come. And uh, I, don't, there's, I dare say you won't walk away disappointed. So great to have you out. Pastor Josh is going to come and close with a song here this morning, and uh, we'll go from there. Sing it together, just as I am. Hymn 149, we'll just sing the first and last verse. We'll be dismissed here. Please keep in mind there's a love offering box located on the welcome desk. And we want to make sure we take care of our guests here this week. And the invitation is always open. If you don't know Christ, we'd love to talk to you at the end of the service and, uh, and, uh, and speak to you, take a Bible and show you how you can know Jesus Christ. No life groups today, but we'll be back tonight at 7 o'clock. God bless you. You're dismissed. Mm -hmm.